Okay. So welcome to uh, this week's Felix seminar. Pleasure to say hello to Anton, who is here on our Marie Curie Fellowship to work on things like this. Uh, Strongfield QED, high power laser. Anton is an old friend of this institution, institute or school or us. Uh, uh, he was here as a postdoc 2000, around 2008 for two years after graduating at Durham. Uh, he went on to Trinity College in Dublin and from there to Sweden, first Umeå and then Gothenburg. And from there he's now arrived back in the UK. Today he'll be talking about a uh, very special relative. Hello. It's lovely to be back. Okay, so I'll talk about work uh, from earlier in the year. It's on the archive, published in Fierce FD. And the goal of the talk is to establish a connection or correspondence. I can do volume. Uh, I can do volume. Uh, a connection or correspondence between two different theories. On the one hand, something called very special relativity. On the other hand, something called strong field QED. So I'll start off the talk by giving you a brief introduction to both of these topics. Then we'll look at classical particle motion in background fields, and from there we'll see some we'll see a hint of this connection. And the last part of the talk is just about establishing this connection firmly at the quantum level. Uh, and it's basically all about QED today in different guises. So let's start with very special relativity. What's that? Well, this is an idea from Cohen and Glashow, uh, Glashow, and it starts with the idea that something there is physics beyond the standard model. We don't know what it is. Um, what might it be? Well, one idea is that the space-time symmetries that we see, in, we see in the standard model might just be an effective description of some more fundamental symmetry. So the idea is just, let's suppose that Lorentz symmetry is not the fundamental, or Poincaré symmetry, is not the fundamental symmetry with nature, Let's assume it's something else and see what happens. Uh, and very special relativity is one of these ideas. So you say we're going to replace the Lorentz group with a subgroup of the Lorentz group. And there are very different choices. You're going to keep translation invariance, and then you're just going to build field theories and see what happens. And uh, motivation for this, well, it's cool. Uh, one of the original motivations was that. If you do this, you get a very simple way of including neutrino masses into your theories without having to introduce masses in new fields and without having to violate things like lepton number conservation, which is often violated when you try and include neutrino mass. Okay, uh, and very special relativity, I'm just going to call VSR throughout the talk. So, so you're reducing it? You're reducing the Lorentz group to something smaller. Okay, okay that's it. Yeah. Uh, and the, the group that you can choose is going to be two, three, or four dimensional. Uh, we're going to look at a particular group today called SIN2. This is the largest group, the largest subgroup of the Lorentz group that you can have. Uh, it's generated by rotations about the z axis, boosts along the z axis, and then two combinations of boosts and rotations in a direction that's transverse to z. These four things call form the group. It's called SIM2, for reasons that I forget. Um, that's the maths. The physics is as follows. So, yeah. Are you saying that there's, there's a, a special dimension direction? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Spoilers. Okay, sorry, I, I didn't get that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Spoilers is a preferred direction. Yeah, exactly. That's what it, it boils down to. Um, so the physics of this is that if you have a theory which is invariant under SIM2, rather than the full Lorentz group, you still have a constant speed of light. You still have the same dispersion relation, so particles are on, on shell at p squared equals constant, p is momentum. If you include parity into SIM2, the group automatically enlarges itself up to the full Lorentz group, which means that violations of Lorentz invariance in this theory are connected to the violations of parity, because they're typically small. And indeed, these uh, generators leave null hyperplanes invariant 
In other words, there is a preferred light-like direction in this theory, which for this choice of generators is just 1001. That's a vector. So there is some preferred direction in this theory. And you might say, okay, this arises from an ether. So there's some weird background ether which has a direction. People have talked about this. Um, something which we'll come back to is that there's a direction, but there is no kind of scale associated with this. So there's no velocity. So there may be an ether, but in very special relativity, you can't tell how fast it's moved. We'll come back to that. And as I said, one of the original motivations for looking at VS, VSR and SIN2 are neutrino masses. Let's see how that works. So because of this preferred direction, your Lagrangian, your equations of motion, everything else, can contain additional terms which you can't have in a Lorentz invariant theory. In particular, SIN2 allows you to have terms which look like this. Here's the preferred direction, and it's divided by m dot spatial derivative. So this is some horribly not local thing. And in particular, the Dirac equation, p slash equals m, becomes in VSR this equation. So it's p slash minus a new term, which contains this uh, n over m dot d. Here it is in momentum space. And there's a little parameter on top, delta m squared. Delta m squared, it's a mass squared, parameterizes all Lorentz violating Lorentz invariance violating effects on the figure. Okay, so it's just a parameter that you put in your Lagrangian every day. If that's zero, you're back to the Dirac equation. If you square this up, you get the mass shell condition, p squared equals m squared. If you square this up, you get p squared is m squared plus delta m squared. So a particle which looks massless in the standard model kind of actually has a very small mass in very special relativity just because of the symmetry structure. And that's the basic idea. So okay, you say delta m is a small neutrino mass. And then you go and do your phenomenology and see how big this mass can be, etc. Okay. Um, so what interested me in this was that I saw these two equations in a paper and I realized that I'd seen these somewhere else. So let's look, let's leave the SR alone for a minute and see where else these equations appear. Yes, Nate? Yeah, I mean, uh, usually when a mass is in zero, there is a symmetry. Now you are uh, changing the structure of the space, uh, yeah. not one of the internal symmetry. Now, I mean, there's going to be a mixture between uh, the internal symmetry and the space symmetry at some point, such that uh, you can violate the symmetry. Oh. Don't me again. <laughs> I'm joking. Well, for example, I think you don't yes. want to be violating variance or conformal invariance mm -hmm. in order to be able to take a mass that is in zero and uh, a mass that is non zero. You violate loads. Yeah. yeah, it's about time. That's right. Well, uh, so, Lorentz internal symmetries are not unique between those three. Well, I mean, one is an internal symmetry, the other is a uh, space. Which one is the internal symmetry? The equation that I have. 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 The equation Okay, so that was VSR. Now, let's take, go back to ordinary QED. Um, well, ordinary field theory, specifically QED, but now I'm going to have a background field in the picture. And we'll keep things simple. We have a background plane wave field, um, monochromatic, circularly polarized. Here's the gauge potential. I'm going to absorb the coupling into the potential and call it little a. This is a, uh, just a simple wave, cosine, a sine. It's a plane wave, so it depends on some light-like direction, usually x minus t. So well, obviously we're going to take the same direction as we had in VSR, because we want to make a connection with two theories. Um, there is a frequency scale, because it's a wave. Okay, that's not like VSR, but there is no velocity of the ether. Here there is. And this wave, of course, has some amplitude, some intensity, which I'll write as a naught, it's dimensionless. Um, this is a very basic model for a laser field, which is kind of 
popular, certainly in our group. Uh, and the interesting thing is that for modern laser facilities, this comes at a naught, which is the coupling can be larger than one, which means perturbation theory goes out the window, and you have to do everything either non-perturbatively or toward orders. So it's an interesting theoretical challenge. Um, but that's okay, because motion in a plane wave background is integral. There are uh, enough symmetries, conserved quantities, to allow you to solve all your equations of motion. So the Lorentz force equation, Klein Gordon equation, Dirac equation, and everything else can all be solved exactly. So you can make quite a bit of analytic progress. And if you start doing calculations, you calculate cross sections and rates and probabilities in this background field, you find that they depend in particular on an average taken over many oscillations of this background. Okay? So you have a background field, all it's doing is oscillating away. And you find that <coughs> so objects averaged over this over these oscillations play a particularly important role. Uh, and just to give you an example, we're going to look at something classical. So this is the classical momentum of a particle in this background field. Okay. Uh, so kinematic momentum pi, pi squared is n squared, is given by some initial momentum. There's the gauge field again, and here is a term uh, in the direction of the laser wave vector. And a look, that's familiar. Okay, this is the same structure as you saw in VSR. If I take this and I average over the oscillations of the field, so basically I'm turning this wiggly motion into a straight line, well, that's a rapidly oscillating function, so it goes away. That's a rapidly oscillating function, so it goes away. And A squared, or A is just causes and signs, so this averages to a constant, yes. And this is the expression that you get. So the average momentum, which we'll call Q, contains two terms. There it is again the quasi-momentum, and if you square the quasi-momentum, you find that it is on shell at m squared plus an extra term, which contains this intensity parameter, this is called the effective mass. Okay, notice also that when I average, the frequency scale has dropped down to these expressions. <coughs> Aha, so now I've got a momentum and effective mass which look exactly like they do in very special relativity, if I just make the association that the coupling a naught squared times m squared is this VSR parameter delta m squared. So that kind of suggests that there is a connection, at least classically, between VSR theories and background field theories. Yeah, okay. So, because on the one hand, you've got VSR, which is supposed to be some fundamental theory of physics beyond the standard model. On the other hand, you've got QED in a laser, which is something you, you, know, you do experiment in a lab. I don't know why I'm holding a gun. Lasers don't look like <laughs> this. Lasers look like a table. Okay? So let's try and bring these two theories a little bit closer together. Just first of all, in, yeah. in the very special relativity, you're yes. particularly interested in the restless situation. Yeah. Okay. Whereas here we're not. No. No, so um, so in this in this way of describing special relativity that we're going to look at, I can't do neutrino masses at tree level. Uh, I'll come back to that later. But yeah, there's a difference. Yeah. Um, okay, so instead of thinking that we have a laser, let's just have the same background field. So it's QD in a background field. And let's just imagine that this is some space filling thing. Okay, this is some kind of fundamental photon field which fills the universe, neither it comes from beyond the standard model of physics or it's in there from the Big Bang. What, however you want to think about it. So it's not a laser in the lab now, it's some space filling thing. And we imagine that this background field has a very high frequency scale so that any typical process is going to happen over many oscillations of the background field and they won't be able to probe this, this scale. Okay, they won't be able to see the, the oscillations. And the idea is just, well, if you do lots of measurements, and uh, you take an average of those measurements, then you're effectively going to be including an average over these oscillations. And just like for the classical momentum, we'll say, okay, the effective physical observables should be averages over this background field. So that's basically the idea. We want to make an effective theory of QED in a background field by 
averaging out rapidly oscillating terms, like the potential, but of course keeping slowly varying terms like the square of the potential, which averages to a constant. We've already seen that this works at the level of the classical momentum. The question is, does this work for QED? Does this give you a consistent theory? Does it preserve gauge invariance? Or do you just end up with some horrible mess that you can't see? Okay. And uh, the direction of this uh, background field is only some sort of uh, external input. Uh, exactly. Yeah. It's going to point towards somewhere. No, it's like it's not somewhere, so it's not. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Okay. So we start building things up. Let's start with the Dirac equation. Okay. So we start with the Dirac equation in a background field. There it is. I d slash minus a on psi is just m psi. As I said, this thing can be solved exactly. The solutions psi are called Volkov solutions. Here's the expression. Okay, we've got, there's the usual u spinner for an electron, and there's some additional spin structure which contains this preferred direction n slash and the background field a slash. Here's the usual e to the minus i p dot x, in place which you, which you have in the Dirac equation. Here's an extra phase factor. There's the usual Fourier mode for the electron. And then there's another term for positron to jam in the potential. Okay, so it's a complicated thing. And then you do this average. You throw away anything which is rapidly oscillating, you keep anything which is slowly varying, you get another, you now get a different expression, which we'll call psi average, and then you figure out there's a noise in the middle. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's not me. <laughs> <laughs> And then you figure out what this averaged field has, uh, well, sorry, which equation of motion the average field obeys. Um, and so this is the equation that you find. It's id slash minus m, but with an additional term, with exactly these structures that you, could, that you expect from DSR. And all the time I'm making the association that a naught squared m squared, so the coupling is the delta m squared. And if you go to the literature, you find this is exactly the Dirac equation very special relativity. The background field is gone. Instead, I've got a free particle in very special relativity. Right, so that's... So from an energetic point of view, this is changing the structure of the energy moment intensity. Yes. Um, so we the energy change moment... also general relativity and... Yeah. Yeah, so, so the energy moment the... also has extra term in the SR. And... Is it an implication that, in a sense, I don't know, now, we will see this as a, a local deformation or a global deformation of the metric and... Uh, Possibly, if you can. It's very, very small. Um, th there is some work doing the general relative, the generally relative version of very special relativity. You can do it. I don't know. Um, okay, so um, classical motion, yes. Dirac equation, yeah. Okay. Um, in QED, we typically calculate correlation functions, scattering amplitudes, probabilities, which are built up from propagators and vertices. So the next step is to look at propagators. This is the and the only difference between QED and QED in a background field is that the fermion propagators get dressed up. They become much more complicated because the fermions are interacting with the background. So this is the propagator of the fermion um, in the background field. You see the same structure as you had in the solutions to the Dirac equation, obviously. Uh, here's the usual propagator structure. There's a phase, which again is just like in the solutions to the Dirac equation. Um, what do we need to take away from this expression? Just that this propagator is not translation invariant. Obviously, it's all a background field, so you don't have translation invariance. And you can see that explicitly because the propagator depends on both x and y separately. Okay. So you're calculating the propagator, but in some sense it's like a two point function. Sorry, yeah, this is the two point function. Yeah. But it looks like you're. you're it, it looks like its momentum space is well defined. You can do a Fourier transform. 
this isn't a Fourier transform. No. You can see it's not. Yeah, I can see it's got dots. <laughs> yeah, sorry, okay. Yeah. Um, indeed, okay, so. Let's do, uh, so. <coughs> first, maybe that. Okay, so. There's Compton scattering in QED. Right? If I do this in a background field, then. Basically, these legs and this thing in here become much more complicated. <coughs> they look like this, and that's why I call the propagator. But indeed, it, it's more like a two-point function. But it also has x and y dependencies. But it has x and y dependencies. Not so, just x minus. Or no, exactly. So when you write down your Feynman diagram, and then you, your Feynman rules, you have to start in position space. Okay. And then you can make the Fourier transform if you like. Okay. So this is all in position space. Okay, so not translation in America. Let's average it. Keep the slowly varying terms, throw away the oscillating terms. So that's rapidly oscillating, it goes away. That's rapidly oscillating, it goes away. There's some terms which hang around in the phase. Oh, that's the expression you get if you do the average. Uh, it's not particularly pretty, but what we can see is that this is now a Fourier transform. Uh, this is, has become translation invariant. Now this two-point function of propagator depends only on x minus y. So averaging restores translation invariance. And in BSR theories you have translation invariance. Ah, good. Okay. The because this is a Fourier transform, I can read off where the poles are. And the poles have been shifted to m squared plus delta m squared, which is the BSR mass. And again, you go to the literature, you look it up, and this is exactly the propagator for a spin half particle in, in very special relativity. Can you explain in the sense that I'd expect a mass shift if you've got, but also a kind of a Z2 factor, mm -hmm. kind of background Z2. And you're saying it's one? Yeah, it's one. Um, so this, this, it's all the kind of things that. I'll come to the water densities later, yeah. for example. Yeah. Yeah. I'm seeing I'm seeing head shaking at the back. <laughs> so it's, it, it's still you, you can't tell whether you which direction you're going. So. Well, you can't tell which direction. You can't tell whether you're going whether the propagator is, is different in the direction of its first direction or is it in the in the different direction. It looks like it's the same. No, there is the uh, uh, N Q. Yes, I think so there's a little bit longer, but we'd be at Oh, sorry, yes, 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 yes. Okay. Okay. So, sorry, so there, is, there is something which tells you. Oh, yeah, there is something different here. Definitely. Good, okay. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry, sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, if, if I kill free. that, then this would just be a free propagator with the wrong mass, yeah. basically. <laughs> but, um, yeah, this factor. Yeah. 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 Um, I, I would call this some sort of uh, three level formula. Ah. Then I, 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 you, you need to tell me about the renormalization of this, otherwise what we are talking about is uh, a sort of effective theory. Yeah, oh, we are talking about effective theory, in a sense, I, in that I'm getting rid of some degrees of freedom. I'm throwing away loads of terms which contain all these rapid oscillations. It's not a standard effective theory where you just cut off momentum or something. So, okay, so you, you, you're not trying to, to, to develop something that is a BSM or plasma fundamental theory? No, I'm just trying to show you that. Yeah. Yeah, I'm trying to show you if, if I cut out all these rapid oscillations, mm -hmm. so I ignore those, then I turn QED into something else. So but in a well defined way. So it's low energy, right? So you're yeah. averaging over a long time, yeah. place of low energy, but that's, that's the effective part. Yeah, that's the effective part. Yeah. The average over many oscillations. Maybe. Uh, uh, yeah, but the particular limit of, of, of the one of theory that's averaging looks like something which other people have tried to do is yeah exactly as, as, as exactly as theory. Theory. but again yeah. whenever you have um, I mean locality and cutting off modes goes very well together that term is terribly non-local yes, yes. so even as an effective theory it could well be that whenever you try to expand this object to any non-effective theory and move the cutoff mm -hmm. the counter term can be all over the place and Generates terrible mess that is not only encoded in this. 
this is possible. Yeah. Uh, so I'm going to go through the rest of the framework rules and show you how everything works. I haven't done it with normalization. So. Um, okay. So that's propagators. Um, that's that bit, that bit. We also have vertices, yes? So, no, I'm still vertices. Well, this looks good. Okay, a propagator becomes a propagator in very special relativity, but is a vertex inside some correlation function. Okay, it's just one of these bits. And at this vertex, two propagators meet. Here's the spin structure coming from one propagator. Here it is coming from the other. Um, this is a position x. And I'm supposed to be doing an averaging where I keep slowly varying terms. Ah. So clearly the usual vertex factor, the one times the gamma times the one, that's slowly varying, right? It's a constant. But there's also a term where you, from the a slash gamma a slash, and you do all the contractions and there is an a squared term in there. Which means that at vertices, when things start to interact, you generate additional slowly varying terms. So your vertex gets corrected, little gamma goes to big gamma, gets corrected by this term, again, probably non-local, here's the delta m squared on top. It's fine, because once again, you look it up and you find that this is exactly the three-point vertex in very special relativity. Okay, everything has extra terms in very special relativity, and this is exactly the three-point vertex in QED. Um, so that's looking good. So let's do underline that. Provided that you keep all the slowly varying terms, then you get back the correct interaction vertex from, for QED in very special relativity. And it's only by including these extra terms that the water density is preserved and water can change in this. Um, if you don't keep these, that's broken. You break the edge of the Okay, so that's good. Um, that's it, right? We've done propagators, we've done vertices. Unfortunately not. Um, in very special relativity, you have, because it's a horribly not local theory, in a general covariant gauge, QED has an infinite number of different interactions, just from expanding this one of the n quantities. Okay? At which you have two fermions um, that meeting with either one photon, two photons, three photons, four photons. Infinite number. Okay. But we've done the averaging of the propagator, and we've done the averaging of the vertex, and all we've got is the three point vertex. So either the theory that we're getting from this averaging is not very special relativity, it's something else, or we've missed something. Spoiler. <coughs> <sighs> we missed something. We have to go back to the propagator. So here's the propagator again. I've thrown away everything which is not relevant. Right, there's all the usual Dirac stuff to P slash, and here are the extra terms in the Volpa propagator. There is a term where you contract, just like across a vertex, there's a term where you can contract A with P with A and get an A squared. But A is a rapidly oscillating function and it's evaluated at two space-time points, so that is a rapidly oscillating function. It should throw it away. Unless X is 1. Unless you have to be propagating over a very short distance because then when X is approximately Y, this is approximately a squared, and that's approximately, that averages to constant. So the question is, are there any hidden, slowly varying terms inside the propagator that we should have been more careful with? Um, we need to understand the short distance expansion of the propagator, unfortunately. That's well understood. Uh, this Volkov propagator contains a singular term. It contains, so, write out all these spinner terms and you find there's a term which looks like this. Ah, oh, look. It's got n slash over n dot p. That's familiar to VSR. It's translation invariant. Aha, uh -huh, good. Uh, and this integral is proportional to a delta function which contracts n by x and n by p. This is called the instantaneous light front propagator. Uh, well known for people who work on light front field theory. So what happens is that between any two vertices, there's a propagator with a delta function which pulls these two vertices together. You can do the calculation. Here's an example. It's Compton again. 
So this delta function pulls these two vertices together, you do the averaging, and you find that this, what you get, is the four point vertex in VSR. So again, this is kind of an effective description. If you zoom all the way out, this becomes a point, and you get a vertex with two fermions and two photons. Similarly, if you have a more complicated scattering amplitude with three vertices, there will be a term in there which contains the polynomial two delta functions. You can track three vertices together, and you get a two fermion, three photon vertex. And this works to all orders. Again, you need to keep track of all these extra terms, extra vertices, otherwise you ruin gauge invariants and you break your warhead masters. If you keep them, everything's preserved. You've got gauge invariant theory. And that really is it. So, propagator and a three point vertex and all the higher order of vertices of VSR you get out from averaging over the fluctuations of a background field. So, in this sense, very special, so very special relativity, or QED, something very special relativity, is a kind of an effective description of QED in a very high frequency background field. Um, and some of the kind of weird properties of these non-local, very special relativity theories have natural interpretations in this picture. So what is this ether in VSR? Well, it's just a electromagnetic wave. Uh, why is there a preferred direction? Well, it's because the background field has a preferred direction, it's the wave vector. Um, where do these non-local terms come from? Well, we've seen those. That was much earlier, sorry. Um, they were there from the beginning, right? So the momentum of the particle in a background field in the background wave looked like this. Two k p minus a squared m dot p m u. There's that non-local term. If you want to ask why this structure turns up uh, in QED, so just in classical electrodynamics, um, that just that term has to be there to satisfy the mass shell condition. There's nothing weird about it. That's, good, that's, that's just mass shell condition. And that just survives when you do your averaging, and that's why it appears in VSR. It's translation, so VSR is translation invariant, even though it's non local, um, because translation invariance, as we saw, is restored by averaging. And also when you do that averaging, the frequency scales drop out, which is why you've got a preferred direction, an ether, but you don't see the velocity of the ether. It gets washed away when you do the average. That's it. Um, so there is a connection between QED and VSR and QED in the background field. So you can take this in a bunch of directions. I said in the beginning that VSR is based on choosing a subgroup of the Lorentz group. I only looked at one particular subgroup today, SIM2. There are others, so you can see if you can play this game with the other groups. You can try and extend this idea to other sectors of the standard model. And then going back to what David asked, so here the VSR parameter, this delta m squared, I associated with the coupling between an electron and a laser, excuse me, that obviously contains the electron charge, yeah, neutrinos, however, are neutral, which means that this doesn't give you neutrino masses at tree level, like ordinary VSR does, but it's not impossible that you'll get neutrino mass radiatively through you know, loops of charged particles interacting with the background and entering some of these neutrino mass. It'd be interesting to find out if that was possible or not. It's also another option, maybe, uh, if you find a kind of clever scaling of all your variables and parameters, you can do some laser physics experiment and then say, okay, by cunning rescaling, I'm actually doing a VSR experiment. So maybe in the same sense as lab astrophysics, you could do VSR in your lab. Maybe. That's work in progress. That's it. Thank you. Thanks, Anton. Time for questions. Ben, Lydia, please. Hi, oh, Hi, Ben. Um, Hi, ben. <laughs> so, you know, you've got a delta M also in something QD from the electron subclass. Right? So, oh, yeah. Does, can that be approached in the same kind of way? Because you talk about these instantaneous propagators. Would you then, for that kind of diagram, join the two vertices together, and what would that be? Well, loops in general, actually. So, you're asking, does this affect the. 
the self energy. Yeah, so the electron self energy gives you, if it's put on a plane wave background, gives you an, another delta M, another source of delta M, if you like. It's at the loop level rather than. Yeah. Yep. Can that also, is there also an analogy with VSR there? or? Um. Particularly because you talk about these instantaneous propagators. Yeah. So, I, was that something that could be future work on? I don't know. Um, let's see. I'm not. I'm it's, not quite. it's spin dependent on delta m in that case, so maybe it's. <laughs> um, so maybe it's not. I'm unsure, to be honest. Okay. I mean, certainly that diagram is going to get. Corrected. Yeah. But then it's just another correction that we can have to look at. I don't know if there's a direct relation between that delta M and a VSR description. Yeah, so there may be things in the plane wave field that aren't in the VSR description. That's what yeah, of course. The plane wave so the, the plane wave theory is much bigger. Yeah. Right? Because remember I'm averaging out a load of degrees of freedom to get to the VSR stuff. Yeah. So it might be that some effects get washed out. Since in the end, I mean, you were hinting that nothing is going to change through the uh, fact that you are looking at the world identity. Yes. But the world identity is out, actually. Yeah, anyway. Um, okay, so in VSR, you either have um, the usual propagator for the photon, and then all of these. Interact high order interaction vertices, or you go to light front gauge, and then the photon propagator gets a non local term for n mu k mu plus omega k mu over n dot k all over k squared, and then you're back to just the ordinary. Um, general covariant gauge is awful. Light front gauge is very simple at the expense of yeah, these things cropping up. You think of those on the I mean, I mean, that does not worry you the fact that you are changing the, the photon propagator. No. Uh, no, 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 no. This is this, this is a standard gauge choice, even well, not standard. You just have to yeah, deal with all the non covariant yeah, terms. Yeah, you would never want to do, I, don't know, I guess you wouldn't want to do a renormalization of this picture because it's. Yeah, I'm yeah. thinking about renormalization. Yeah. Some, something like that looks terribly yeah. messy to me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I fear that you could come up with a lot of terms that are <coughs> not under control. Good problem. Not sure. It's, it's, uh, so, uh, renormalization must be much harder because mm. because you've got less symmetry. Right? So you, you, you cannot rely yeah. on, on Lorentz. So you've got non Lorentz violating counterpairs and all these kinds of stuff. Yeah, yeah, but not only you are introducing your non locality. So the, the the spectrum of operator that you can have that yeah, yeah. But, is, but it's, uh, not, it's not unheard of. If you look at your Kane and Twelve, they do re they renormalize QED in Coulomb gauge, and it, it's a mess, but it's possible. But, but this, I mean, yeah. there is there's a huge literature about trying to renormalize an axial time gauges, gauges yeah. and yeah. What, what one over n dot k means and then certain things were this is what you do and then it was proven to be wrong and other things believed to work but only in one loop calculations. Mm -hmm. yeah. it's not so I mean for the purposes of, of this calculation to show these two things are connected, then whatever normalization you choose in QED for this thing, whatever definition, just gets inherited on the VSR side. But I agree, if you then actually Try and do a calculation and do a normalization. It's not possible. Is there a, a very special game you can play with homophilia? Yeah. And is there a, a very special laser? <laughs> <laughs> a very special color charge electronic well, laser? I'm just thinking purely at that level. Is, is, is a jet a very? 
Yeah, we yeah that's the, where the, 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 the that's where I'm surrounded by blue ones. Yeah, so um, all the VSR stuff works for Nonabelia. It's all there. Cool. Um, you could try playing the same. Again, it removes the jet type stuff. You need plain wave solutions of the unknowns equation, yeah, which does. Coleman has found, so they, yeah, yeah, they yeah. do exist. Yeah, they do. As a project for you. <laughs> 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 uh, so you've got Ian Samuelson's uh, kind of model, but also you modified the you ended up with a modified vertex. Yeah. The base vertex. So if you were to uh, use it to do something like the anomalous magnetic component and the new one, I don't see how you have a modified vertex, but then you might be hard to suppress it. So, uh, I mean if you wanted to shrink the parameters and mm. make it spread a very small question. Uh, in the sort of analogy of anomalous magnetic components, if you have a modified vertex, yeah. that could produce a different magnetic component than the new one, and then you want to shrink the numbers to be very, very small. Yeah. Uh, which parameter would you choose to do that with? There is, there is only the one parameter, it's, it's delta m squared. Okay, so it has to be very, very small. It has to be very, very small. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, so you have this for a light like background. Is there any kind of an analogy if you're looking at space like or a, a time like uh, other magnetic field? Um, so, one of the other subgroups, for example, does that give you like an background or something like that? So, possibly. Uh, let's see. If we go back to. So, here's the group. Let's see. If I throw away K3, then I get a group called E2. That's two kind of transverse boosts and rotations. So maybe that would correspond to a. So th this this is one of the open questions, right? Yeah. It, it might work. There might be a DB on the backgrounds. Yeah. Uh, but this this is the one. The light light corresponds to something. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Any other questions? <laughs> Um, so in a vacuum, in a, uh, if you go out of background, so like magnetic fields, so you don't have one, one zero zero one. Obviously, you have one zero zero n, where n is the, the flat of index. Yeah. Um, does that kind of alter this this correspondence that you have? I mean, is yeah, it does mess. That's going to mess it up entirely, actually, because we've lost the symmetry. Okay. Uh, okay. So this is the this is invariant under these generators. If that's an end there with a refractive index, it's not invariant anymore. And Are the limits on this delta m parameter? Yeah. How does it compare with the limits on the refractive index? They're both much more restrictive. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a question. What's the what's the average Lagrangian? Uh, if there is such a thing. Can you write down a, a, the VSR QED Lagrangian? Yeah, we can. Um, of course, you won't get that from just averaging the. No, <coughs> you won't get that from averaging um, the QED Lagrangian in the background field because then the field just gets averaged out. It's, you, you, I mean, it would be the effective Lagrangian, the, yeah. which kind of is behind if this effective diagram. Yeah, exactly. Uh, let's play a game and uh, let's take out of playing these to uh, the weak sector so that I can give uh, uh, mass to an L2 you know. yeah. uh, Which is the measure that will most affect uh, the constraint on that band? In the sense, I mean, uh, you are adding not only mass to a dendrino, but you're adding mm -hmm. a lot of uh, deformation to utilize uh, other yeah. measurements. And, Weather changing in that current and all of these. Yeah. Where, where do we look at the, the, the strongest bound? Uh, I forget. I don't know. Um, the bounds are already very strong on this delta M parameter. And I think I remember which process it is. So, 
Any more questions? Just need to find one with no one else. You mentioned experiments. Do you have an idea? Like? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what experiment you would like to look at? Uh, I just actually have an question. This is about the weak sector, but I'm talking about the uh, VSR. Oh, laser. Oh, okay. Okay. Thing. Um, is there a particular experiment you'd like to be able to look at? You know, maybe quite a engine or something like that. Very long laser pulse um, or something like that. I guess that. Do you want it to be as? Yeah, so that's the the, the the final kind of open topic I propose. Yeah. So, laser, low frequency, high intensity. This background ether thing has got to be high frequency, low intensity. It can't be high intensity, right? Because we're all getting buffeted by electromagnetic waves all the time. Mm. Um, so there, that's the question. Can you do some clever scaling trick? Mm. Um, so so at the minute, I don't know how you do a laser experiment mm. and interpret it in terms of VSL. That's something to look at. Okay, so the radiation has to be made even from, you know, compton scattering, not from a laser, but some kind of gamma beam or something. Yeah, most of them like this. But you certainly need long pulses. Okay. Yeah. That's certainly uh, okay. okay. Great, thanks. So the, the, there's one one thing that which slightly bothers me. If you say high frequency, this is, of course, not a Lorentz invariant statement. So, no, it's not. so which it implies to your question. That, so there's a preferred light-like direction. Yeah. Right? So there's a which means there's a preferred light direction where this cosmic laser is pointing. So should so if one moves then in this direction or against it or, or, or with, with, with the high frequency, then you get get blue or red shifts, right, don't yeah. you? The Doppler effect. Yeah, so this it sort of kind of implies the existence of some cutoff. So the idea is it's very high frequency scale compared to anything that we can reach. But obviously if I just boost all the way to the speed of light, then yes, I'm going to start to shift this frequency down to nothing. So that little breaks down. Sure. So there's an implied 